So talking about ADHD, I want to talk a little bit about my story on how I got myself a diagnosis. The first time I ever went to a psychiatrist was when I was in K2. I went there, they told me that nothing was wrong with me, and they told me to get over my shyness. I went back in second grade, very same thing. However, it wasn't always like that. When I was in sixth grade, I finally went to a neurologist who diagnosed me with attention deficit disorder. And I started taking medicine. But the thing is, because I had ADD and not ADHD, I was told that I was over-exaggerating my symptoms and I had to take a lesser dose. Luckily, that was fixed this year and I can focus much better now. However, at the same time in the middle school, I started having other problems. Talking to my classmates was a big deal for me. I couldn't ask my teachers for help. Sometimes I left group projects simply because I was afraid I'd say something wrong. Later on, I was diagnosed with social anxiety. So now that I've talked a little bit about mental illness, what exactly is mental illness? Well, over here, it says that mental illnesses are health conditions involving changes in emotion, thinking, or behavior, or a combination of those. Mental illnesses are associated with distress and or problems functioning in social work or family activities. Now, those are a lot of words, but in reality, what is this saying? What this is saying is that mental illnesses are in fact health problems that you have to deal with constantly, every day. So, for example, um, being shy. You can use, being shy does affect you every day, but it stems from mental illness, and you might wonder why that is. The reason for that is that mental illnesses are also constantly keeping you from doing things. For example, if you're shy, then you might have to wait a second before you ask a question in class, or you might have to wait until the class ends to ask that question. But if you have social anxiety, then you might have a full-blown panic attack over it. Now, I do want to talk about some statistics. So, something that I do want to, for you to notice is that ADHD does tend to affect kids more, um, specifically boys. And I do want to say that it, that ADHD and overall mental illnesses are very hard to diagnose. So in reality, that number might be much bigger. So, talking about statistics, here are some statistics I gathered from over here, right in Chile. So, did you know that the biggest diagnosis for a medical license, so a license that allows you to leave your work due to health issues, is actually correlated to mental illness. So, you might not have the energy to get out of bed, you might be having so much anxiety that you can't think well and you can't work. And actually, after the pandemic, there was a big increase of medical license, specifically in the health department due to COVID. So I would like to thank all of those people for constantly being out for us. Um, and I also want to talk about DALIs or Disability Adjusted Life Years. 
what dallies are in the end is how much of your life do you really lose due to dealing with a mental illness. So instead of just going out to ask that question, how much time do I really lose just thinking it over, over and over again? Well, that would actually be approximately a fourth of your life, which is a lot. Um, then I do want to say that subthreshold of ADHD is common. So what that means is ADHD is a pretty common mental illness. But what the subthreshold of ADHD might be are the different variations of it. For example, attention deficit disorder. And this is usually seen with higher class families with fewer conflicts. It is seen often in female patients and also in older patients. Um, there are three main symptoms for ADHD. The first one is impulsivity. So basically, you don't think over things. You just kind of rush straight to them. And probably you end up regretting them later. The other one is hyperactivity. You can't sit still. And the third one, as the name dictates, is inattention. These people can't really pay attention. However, those are the three main symptoms, but what are some other symptoms? Well, as you can see in the list here, disorganization and problem prioritizing. So for example, I might have, I might have to fold the clothes, wash the dishes, and walk the dog. And so then what I would do, a normal person would do is Okay, first I'm going to fold the clothes, then I'm going to wash the dishes, and then I'm going to walk the dog. But a person with ADHD might not know how to make that difference, and they'll just get stuck trying to do all three tasks, focusing too much on one, or they might all be of the very same importance to the point where they simply can't decide which one to start off on, leaving them stuck. There's also a sluggish cognitive tempo, so what that means is basically if you ask a neurotypical person, hey, what's two plus two? Then they will immediately answer four. But a person with a sluggish cognitive tempo will look up in the air for about five seconds before saying, oh yeah, that's two, it's four. And there's also poor time management skills. Um, poor planning, so for example, you start the day off to eat breakfast, then you dress up, then you go to school. A person with ADHD maybe won't plan that far ahead and will probably end up going all over the place. There's also trouble multitasking, so again with the chores, wash the dishes, walk the dog, or maybe even it can be, okay, so I have to listen to a podcast and I have to walk the dog. And those are two things that you can probably do at the same time, but the person with ADHD might just stay stuck listening to the podcast or be so focused on walking the dog around that they might forget to actually pay attention to what the podcast is listening, is saying. Many of them also have low frustration tolerance. Um, I think unfinished task speaks for itself, but low frustration tolerance, what that means is basically you poke a neurotypical person five times, they'll say, hey, cut it out. You do that to a person with ADHD and they will bite your head off. Um, there's also forgetfulness. So what was I talking about again? There's also restlessness, so they 
can't stop moving. It's not the same as hyperactivity because hyperactivity involves I want to run around everywhere, I want to jump, and I want to, to do everything all at once. Well, restlessness might be just more tapping their fingers. Just these very small movements that never stop. They, people with ADHD usually have poor sleeping patterns. So they might not be able to fall asleep on time. Or they might wake up at a different time. And they usually have trouble socializing because it's hard for people with ADHD to pick up social cues. Um, there are also impaired neuropsychological domains. <laughs> and what that means basically is that our brains work a little bit different, especially with things that, with things such as our senses, or just, emo or just emotional things in specific. So, Maybe they have uh, trouble seeing the colors yellow and blue. Or they might have heightened senses. So, for example, they could have a really, really good sense of smell, and certain smells really bother them. And honestly, the same could go for any of the, the five senses. So, I do also want to say some of the DSM-5 criteria for ADHD. So what the DSM-5 is, it's the global book for diagnosing mental illnesses. It's kind of like a worldwide manual. And so what the criteria for ADHD is, is several inattentive or hyperactive impulsive symptoms presenting before the age of 12 years. So before your brain starts to mature, several symptoms that are present in two or more settings. So maybe the same symptoms could be very different at home than they could at school, or they could be the same. But it has to be in at least two different settings that these symptoms are presenting. Um, as I said, the only way to really diagnose a mental illness is if it's uh, constantly interfering with your life. So evidence that the symptoms interfere with day-to-day -day functioning and that these symptoms are not better explained by another mental disorder. So for example, you might say, you know, this person is constantly staring out to space. They are probably have ADHD. But then you realize that that could also be explained by epilepsy. And again, with the subject of ADHD, I want to talk about the three main ways that ADHD presents itself. So the first type and the type that I represent is the inattentive type. This is also the rarest type of ADHD. So basically people who are inattentive might not be all over the place but you will definitely find them zoning out from time to time. There's also the hyperactive impulsive type, which is basically, they do go all over the place. They're constantly running around and jumping, and they make some very rash decisions. And then the most common type of way that the ADHD presents is the combined way. So basically, these people are pretty hyperactive, but they're also pretty inattentive. And uh, I don't know if you can tell this, but those are two of my cousins. So bringing up to that, um, ADHD does have a pretty high heritability. So then, now that you know a bunch about ADHD, what can I do for it? I mean, does it have no cure? The answer is that there is no cure for ADHD, but there are different ways that you can prove it. And the way that this graph is organized is that the bigger circles show the ways that have been proven to work more. So the biggest one is the one that says 
pharmacotherapy. And what that basically means is taking medication. Taking ADHD medication, honestly, at least for me, it absolutely changed my life. After that, there is um, environmental, uh, environmental centered intervention. So this basically means that maybe if you're at home and one of your parents finds you zoning out, you can ask them to tap you on the shoulder. And whenever they tap you on the shoulder, you go right back to getting concentrated. I also do want to say that there is that the only type of therapy known to treat ADHD is cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, making sports and recreational activities, as well as mindfulness, show a little um, less, have not been proven to, have not, do not have, sorry, don't have a very high rate for improving ADHD though. So going back to pharmacotherapy, here are a bunch of the medicines that people with ADHD can take. And I myself take the very top one. So then, now that you guys uh, know all about uh, ADHD, what am I doing to help myself with this? Well, there are many reasons to that. First off, again, I do, um, I do take medicine. My parents often help me out a lot. I do lots of sports, such as diving and mountain biking. I make checklists all the time. If I didn't, I would be completely lost every day. Um, however, seeing as I also struggle with anxiety, I do actually rely a lot on my stuffed animals because if I'm being honest, they can't really say much back to me. And of course, there is a picture of my dogs because who doesn't like dogs? I mean, if there's one thing that can calm you down, it's a dog. However, despite all of these strategies, I do still have a bunch of struggles with mental illness. So I'm constantly forgetting things. Um, I'm not exactly an A plus student either. I do have trouble sleeping and oftentimes socializing. So then, what about the future? Well, actually, I do want to explain a little why I wanted to do this TED Talk in the first place. And the reason is that I was interested because there's a lot of many famous uh, people who struggle with mental illness. A good example of that is Albert Einstein, who was diagnosed with ADHD. And I do believe it that giving people a proper diagnosis when they're still young can really help them later on in life. And I also do want to say that if you think you might struggle with any mental disorder, it is important to, to seek help because Again, an early diagnosis could change your life. As I said, the small pills I take every morning definitely changed my life for the better. I can now concentrate and my grades went up. And I do want as many people to experience that as I possibly can. And lastly, I do want to give a few acknowledgements. So I want to thank TEDx and Nido for giving me this opportunity. And I really want to thank my family for always being there for me.